Welcome to week three. We have arrived on our first island and we are in great need of some supplies for the rest of our journey. Imagine that this island has trees laden with fruits, nuts and berries and clean water springs. Just as planners gather information and knowledge from different sources during the nap process, we need to stock up on these supplies. We will need them to sustain us through the changing tides of our journey on the nap as we visit the next islands. Just like in any other decision-making process, information is key for climate change adaptation planning. Formulating and implementing a national adaptation plan pushes us to find the answers to many challenging questions. Questions about climate risks, future scenarios, existing adaptation policies and activities. And of course, we need to find out what information are we missing. Let's continue with our fruit picking and discover how information and knowledge fit in adaptation planning. Are you ready? Let's start. Climate change adaptation planning is a complex process which requires decision makers to access understand and evaluate many types, sources and tools for handling information. So, what is the knowledge base for adaptation planning? Let's hear a bit on this from Rohini. The issue of information for adaptation planning is a very uh, central issue because uh, uh, adaptation planning requires probably several categories of information. I mean, traditionally, uh, we think that the kind of information required is, is climate information, which is absolutely key and central for countries. But adaptation planning is not only about climate information because there will never be um, the perfect level of information required or the perfect predictions or the perfect forecasts that are required to do a much more rigorous planning process. Because adaptation is a lot about behavioral changes, it's a lot about um, uh, change, it's a lot about adapting activities on the ground, taking up more um, resilient and sustainable practices. And all of this kind of behavior change amongst um, adaptation practitioners, I, I would say, but when we mean those practitioners, we mean everyone from, say the, say the farmer to the health professional, also to the, to the local extension services, to the ministries of agriculture, the monitoring units, they all have to be working on different aspects of adaptation, which means that information is required also on ongoing activities. Uh, and the information needs to be systematically um, uh, collected and, and compiled and regularly updated and should be available in a centralized place. Rohini mentions climate information and information on past and ongoing activities. Can you think of any other sources of information relevant for the NAP? What about information on the risks and vulnerabilities of countries, populations, sectors or ecosystems? Or you have background information on strategic policy planning and legal frameworks. Then there's also socioeconomic information on income, food security, gender and access to basic services. And don't forget data on climate finance. This information can be collected through desk-based literature review, interview with key stakeholders, and by working with climate change experts or institutions. And of course, the internet. A key online tool is the NAP Ag Knowledge Tank, a user-friendly research engine for knowledge materials. It features presentations, case studies, latest reports on activities and projects. Take a moment to click through this tool. Can you find something useful for your peer assessment building block? So, how do information and knowledge fit in adaptation planning? It's a two-way process. On one hand, the NAP must be built on strong scientific knowledge base that informs planning and implementation decisions. On the other hand, the NAP can also strengthen the knowledge base and data collection, produce additional analyses, and provide capacity development of key stakeholders. As you can see, 
Adaptation planning calls for the use of different sources of knowledge. The Paris Agreement acknowledges that adaptation action should be based on and guided by the best available science and, as appropriate, traditional knowledge, knowledge of indigenous people and local knowledge systems. So with that, let me ask you a question. Do you know why in some valleys of Peru, the Quechua people plant a potato that never yields? Indigenous food systems have a unique capacity to generate food from the environment without depleting the resource base. Across the world and over millennia, indigenous people have come up with ways of living that have not only provided food, shelter and rich cultural heritage, but have done so while preserving the environment in which they live. Their knowledge is more important than ever in answering the question of how to feed 9 billion humans amidst climate change. Are you still thinking about the potatoes? Well, the answer is that the Quechua know a special potato variety that can stop the surrounding ones from freezing, even though it does not yield. In a way, indigenous people have already developed and tested today's answers to many of tomorrow's challenges. This is why some countries have included indigenous knowledge in their NAPAs and NAPs. In Uganda, for example, um, indigenous practices such as water harvesting and using seeds to purify water were part of the NAPA consultations. Of course, finding effective climate adaptation solutions requires time and resources to better understand and document many of these indigenous traditional practices. Despite their resilience, in recent times, indigenous people are being progressively pushed into situations of increased vulnerability. Do you think that traditional practices and knowledge are under threat of modernization? You can answer this question in this week's poll and see what others have to say. When it comes to adaptation planning, one size does not fit all. Climate change adaptation implies a process of institutional and behavioral change, which is only possible when underlying social and gender issues are analyzed and addressed. Different people have different aspirations, needs and constraints, which have to be understood. Otherwise, the solutions will not be relevant and will fail at best and do great damage at worst. To this end, Gender mainstreaming is a process used to ensure that men's and women's needs are addressed and that the implications of any planned action on different groups are considered. What are the ways in which climate change impacts gender relations and roles? What are the ways in which gender norms can shape adaptive capacity of women and men? Gender analysis is the tool which helps policymakers answer these questions, assess differentiated climate change impacts, and identify gender sensitive adaptation actions. In agriculture, some of the key questions for gender analysis of adaptation actions are about access to resources and decision making power. Access to resources is often an adaptation game changer. Someone who can access resources, land, water, credit, is more likely to have more to work with in building resilience. Women and men, depending on their place in the decision-making dynamics, may have different capacities to make choices. Choices about how to protect their well-being and livelihoods that are at risk due to climate change. Now we will hear from Sybil Nelson, FAO's gender advisor about mainstreaming gender into adaptation planning. Gender mainstreaming is a strategy for achieving gender equality, is globally recognized as the main approach for ensuring that the needs of men and women are addressed in all phases of project and policy processes. Gender mainstreaming is important in the context of adaptation because it is critical for ensuring that the impacts of climate change on men and women are understood and addressed in adaptation 
so that the eventual impacts of adaptation plans and policies are benefiting both men and women in their respective roles equally. Thank you, Sibyl. Now we learned that gender analysis is a useful tool in adaptation planning and can be used for assessing climate impacts and vulnerability and identifying adaptation options. These are examples of the kinds of information which gender analysis provides when shaping gender sensitive policies. Okay, time for a quick recap. In this video, we discussed how information and knowledge fit in adaptation planning. Remember, it's a two-way process. We looked at the different types of information such as indigenous knowledge and gender analysis as a, as a tool that can help planners find truly sustainable solutions and avoid maladaptation. As usual, the lecture notes await you with more information, definitions and resources. It's also time for your peer assessment building block number two. See you in the next video on the use of climate information.